Autumn burnt the trees bare and ran dogs still farther around, fording creek, pl prowling graveyard, as was his custom, and back in the dusk to fire off volleys of barking that shook windows wherever he turned. In the late last days of October, Dog began to act as if the wind had changed and blew from a strange country. He stood quivering on the porch below. He whined, his eyes fixed at the empty land beyond, beyond town. He brought no visitors for Martin. He stood for hours each day, as if leashed, trembling, then shot away straight as if someone had called. Each night he returned later with no one following. Each night Martin sank deeper and deeper in his pillow. Well, people are busy, said Mother. They haven't time to notice the tag dog carries. Or they mean to come visit, but forget. But there was more to it than that. There was a fevered shining in Dog's eyes and his whimpering tick late at night in some private dream. His shivering in the dark under the bed, the way he sometimes stood half, at ni half the night looking at Martin as if some great and impossible secret was his and he knew no way to tell it save by savagely thumping his tail or turning in endless circles, never to lie down, spinning and spinning again. On October 30th, Dog ran out and didn't come back at all, even when after supper Martin heard his parents call and call. The hour grew late, the streets and sidewalks stood empty, the air moved cold about the house, and there was nothing. Nothing. Long after midnight, Martin lay watching the world beyond the cool, clear glass window. Now there was not even autumn, for there was no dog to fetch it in. There would be no winter, for who could bring the snow to melt in your hands? Father, mother, no, not the same. They couldn't play the game with its special secrets and rules, its sounds and pantomimes. No more seasons, no more time. The go-between, the emissary, was lost to the wild throngings of civilization, poisoned, stolen, hit by a car, left somewhere in a culvert. Sobbing, Martin turned his face to his pillow. The world was a picture under glass, untouchable. The world was dead. Martin twisted in bed, and in three days the last Halloween pumpkins were rotting in trash cans, paper mache skulls and witches were burnt on bonfires, and ghosts were stacked on shelves with other linens until next year. To Martin, Halloween had been nothing more than one evening when tin horns cried off in the cold autumn stars, children blew like goblin leaves, along with flinty walks flinging their, he their heads or cabbages at porches, Self-writing names or similar magic symbols on icy windows, all of it as distant, unfathomable as as distant, unfathomable and nightmarish as a puppet show, seen from so many miles away that there is no sound or meaning. For three days in November, Martin watched alternate light and shadow sift across his ceiling. The fire pageant was over forever. Autumn lay in cold ashes. Martin sank deeper yet deeper in white marble layers of bed motionless, listening, always listening. Friday evening, his parents kissed him goodnight and walked out of the house into the hushed cathedral weather toward a motion picture show. Miss Tarkins from next door stayed on, the po stayed on in the parlor below until Martin called down he was sleepy, then took, her knitting off ho then took her knitting off home. In silence, Martin lay, following the great move of stars, down a clear and moonlit sky, remembering nights such as this when he'd spanned the town with dog ahead, behind, around, about, tracking the green plush ravine, lapping slumberous streams gone milky with the fullness of the moon, leaping cemetery tombstones while whispering the marble names on, quickly on, through shaved meadows, where the only motion was the off-on quivering of stars, to streets where shadows could not stand aside for you but crowded all the sidewalks for mile on mile, run now run, chasing being chased by bitter smoke, fog, mist, wind, ghost of mind, fright of memory, home, safe, sound, snug, warm, asleep, nine o'clock. Chime. The drowsy clock in the deep stairwell below. Chime. Dog, come home and run the world with you. Dog, bring a thistle with frost on it, or bring nothing else but the wind. Dog, where are you? Oh, listen now, I'll call. Martin held his breath. Way off somewhere, a sound. Martin rose up, trembling. There again, the sound. No small, so small a sound, 
like a sharp needlepoint brushing the sky long miles and miles away. The dreamy echo of a dog barking, the sound of a dog crossing fields and farms, dirt roads and rabbit patches, running, running, letting out great barks of steam, crackling the night, the sound of a circling dog which came and went, lifted and faded, opened up, shut in, moved forward, went back as if the animal were kept by someone on a fantastically long chain, as if the dog were running and someone whistled under the chestnut trees in mold shadow, tar shadow, moon shadow, walking, and the, and the dog circled back and sprang out again toward home. Dog, Martin thought. Oh, dog, come home, boy. Listen, oh, listen, where have you been? Come on, boy, make tracks. Five, ten, fifteen minutes near, very near the bark. The sound Martin cried out, the sound Martin cried out, thrust his feet from the bed, leaned to the window. Dog, listen, boy, dog, dog, he said it over and over. Dog, dog, wicked dog, run off and gone all these days. Bad dog, good dog, home, boy, hurry, and bring what you can. Near now, near up the street, barking to knock clapboard house fronts with sound, whirl iron cocks on rooftops in the moon, firing off volleys. Dog, now at the door below, Martin shivered. Should he run? Let dog in or wait for mom and, da and dad? Wait. Oh, God, wait? But what if dog ran off again? No, he'd go down, snatch the door wide, yell, grab dog in, and run upstairs so fast, laughing, crying, holding tight, that dog stopped barking. Hey! Martin almost broke the window, jerking to it. Silence, as if someone had told dog to hush now. Hush, hush. A full minute passed. Martin clenched his fists below, a faint whimpering. Then slowly the downstairs front door opened. Someone was kind enough to have opened the door for dog. Of course, the dog had brought Mr. Jacobs, or Mr. Gillespie, or Miss Tarkins, or... The downstairs door shut. Dog raced upstairs, whining and flung himself on the bed. Dog! Dog, where have you been? What have you done? Dog! Dog! And he crushed dog so hard and longed to himself, weeping, Dog! Dog! He laughed and shouted, Dog! But after a moment he stopped laughing and crying suddenly. He pulled back away. He held the animal and looked at him, eyes widening. The odor coming from dog was different. It was a smell of strange earth. It was a smell of night within night, the smell of digging down deep in shadow, where long hidden in, in shadow through earth that had lain cheek by jowl with things that were long hidden and decayed. A stinking and rancid soil fell away in clods of disillusion from dog's muzzle and paws. He had dug deep. He had dug very deep indeed. That was it, wasn't it? Wasn't it? Wasn't it? What kind of message was this from dog? What could such a message mean? The stench, ripe and awful cemetery earth. Dog was a bad dog, digging where he shouldn't. Dog was a good dog, always making friends. Dog loved people. Dog brought them home. And now, moving up the dark hall steps at intervals, came the sound of feet. One foot dragged after the other, painfully, slowly, slowly, slowly. Dog shivered. A rain of strange night earth fell seething on the bed. Dog turned. The bedroom door whispered in. Martin had company.